So here we are trying, we're taking a risk and trying to do a Zoom meeting. Let's see how it goes. Take it away, Leslie and the risk people. Yay. Hi there. Hello. Um, today we're going to talk about the show Risk, true stories people never thought they'd dare to share. Um, and we have some of the uh, collaborators of the show with us. So why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, I'm Kevin Allison. I'm the host and creative director of Risk, the podcast, and now the live streams. Um, and I'm JC Cassis. I'm the business manager and producer of Risk. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being with us today. Um, Kevin, the show started as a live storytelling show nine years ago. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came up with that idea? Well, you know, I had been doing a lot of comedy uh, back in the 90s, and I got, a friend of mine encouraged me, he said, you know what, I think that you're more interesting on stage when you just tell the raw truth, when you just <laughs> speak about your actual life. And I said, that sounds too risky. And he said, that's a good word to cling to because risky stuff is really, really interesting. It means you're opening up so the audience might open up to you. So I got the idea to create a live show and an audio podcast. And the whole idea, I started seeing that there were a lot of storytelling shows out there at that time, like The Moth. And then on radio, there was stuff like This American Life. But those shows had to keep things very family friendly. They had to kind of censor a lot of the stuff that might be too intimate or too emotional or too violent or sexual or anything like that. So I realized that doing an audio podcast, I could have a completely uncensored show so that people could be as intimate as they might be when talking to a therapist. And so that was the idea. Wow. And it really came across as I, I saw, I listened to the show or watched the show on Zoom last night. And the subject matter for the four different people that presented was very, very varied and very intimate. So tell us a little bit about how you get people for the show. It's interesting because of my background in comedy in the early the first year or two of the podcast existence, I was just asking a lot of people that I know, like Margaret Cho, Sarah Silverman, Mark Marin, to come and do the show. But what happened was, was that the audience, the Risk listeners, started writing into us, oh my gosh, people are being so honest on this show, I feel like I can talk about, oh, the sexual abuse that I endured as a child, or how my marriage just completely fell apart, or whatever it might be. Some of them hilarious, some of them scary, some of them absolutely beautiful stories. And so really, honestly, it's more stories from absolutely ordinary folks who are not performers or writers that are kind of the meat and potatoes of the podcast, even though we still include plenty of writers and actors and comedians and whatnot. It's really the ones we cherish the most that are coming from the middle of the country, from people who have never stepped on a stage before. So it's really two different things. They are, they are not only sharing a story uh, that they never thought they'd share, but they're doing it, of course, in public on a stage. So those are two things that, that as you say, regular people don't often do. Now, because of the current uh, virus situation, you guys have moved to a Zoom format. Was last night your first Zoom show? It was our fifth. Okay. And it was, it, it's been fascinating to us. The spirit of the show is so well, you know, we have such a history behind us now and we have such a passionate audience that everyone's ready for that intimacy. Uh, and so in this transformational process of having people just look right into the green light on their laptops, look right into the camera, they know that there's a few hundred people out there, you know, hanging on their every word. And so really we've been shocked at how able we have been to cross over and still capture that same sort of intimacy. That's a very good point because obviously live theater with an audience is much different, clearly. 
JC, tell us, tell us your involvement and your thoughts about the show. Yeah, so I joined Kevin on the staff in early 2011. So I've been here for about, you know, nine and a quarter years now. And um, when we started, it was just a few of us meeting in a coffee shop, you know, trying to figure out what the hell are we doing and how the hell are we going to do it. And we just kind of kept putting one foot in front of the other. And nine years later, we have a book and a successful podcast and a touring live show and now online live shows and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just, I, I love being a part of it. I, I, started being a part of it because I started listening to the podcast because I knew of Kevin from having been on the state on MTV. And um, I've just stayed with it because I feel like I can bring my whole self to the job and I feel like I believe in it so much. And it's just been a, a really fun and wild ride. Show I the see book. Show the book. Oh, oh yeah. yes. This is our book. So uh, this was uh, in 2018, we came out with a collection of some of our very favorite stories that have been shared on the podcast only sort of rewritten for, you know, personal essay form. And there's all sorts of fabulous people in it, like Michael Ian Black and Lily Taylor, Aisha Tyler, AJ Jacobs, Dan Savage, Mark Marin. So it's a real, real treat. Oh, I would imagine. Can you, can you tell um, just a few, give a few examples of the kinds of stories that people have told? Well, I am a very out loud and proud uh, gay and kinky man. So I share a lot of my adventures in the realm of going to kink camps and doing <laughs> kink education with people. So those are a lot of fun for folks. Um, but we also have had some kink stories camp. about real trauma that people have been through. Like there's a story in the book called Surrender about a woman who, when she was seven year, 17 years old, got into a car accident that killed three people and how all of the therapy that she had to go through to deal with her feelings about having accidentally done that. So some of those stories like that are just unforgettable and really transformational. You know, people write to us, people email us all the time saying, that story really kind of changed me like it, it, it made me feel like I can handle this or that or it made me feel like I'm not so alone so we're very proud of that aspect of the show well I think where the book is available the book is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold you can also find it at uh, the risk book .com. thank you and thank it's you. in paperback ebook and audiobook hmm. That's wonderful. Um, do you ever, so, so on another note, I know that you, well, or your, tell us of your storytelling classes, that's part of what you do too. So let's say somebody comes to you with a story and they say, um, you know, I have this story that I wanna tell, but it's quite, quite traumatic and I don't really know how to, you know, craft it into a story. So that's something that you help people do. Yes, we have a whole staff of coaches that help people prep stories for the risk mm -hmm. show, but those same people are also the faculty members for our school, the Story Studio at thestorystudio.org. And we do all kinds of classes. We do in-person workshops when people can meet in person. Now we do a lot of Zoom workshops. Uh, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one training, but we also do a lot of corporate workshops to help people, to help businesses uh, make their communication on the job in the office more human and more emotional and more compelling. Well, as, as you said, I read this in one of your other interviews, really it's about connection. And that's something that you can do with these intimate stories. And I would think you're right, helping a business craft its story because it's a story that gets people engaged and involved. Absolutely. Have you, have you ever had anybody send a, an idea, a story idea to you where you, you guys said, oh, that's just a little too far out? Well, we're always very concerned about a couple of things. One, that the storyteller is telling the story compassionately, that the storyteller is bringing all their emotional intelligence into the act of sharing the story and that they're not trying to hurt someone by telling the story. Uh, and so, yeah, there are occasionally times when we're worried that a person might not be in the best mental shape to be sharing their story. So we'll, you know, 
do everything we can, we'll often suggest, hey, you know what, you might really want to work on that story for a bit by talking to a counselor or a therapist or someone like that. Um, but there, but there are also cases that where we just feel like, um, you know, uncomfortable that, that that the story is not compassionate enough toward the other characters in the story. Yes, yes, that's that's, that's you, you can um, screen them that way. Do you think everybody has a story that could be drawn out of him or her? Oh, I think everyone has many stories, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, we always encourage people to first think of the most emotional moments from their lives, the, the time they were most scared or the time they were most thrilled or the time they were most surprised. And when you get people really meditating back on those things, a lot of details start to kind of start you know, brewing back into their mind that they hadn't thought of in the longest time. And it's very, it's, it's very therapeutic, not just for the people listening, but for the storyteller as well, to be reworking what they lived through and, and making sense of it. JC, what about you? Have, you? have you done any of these stories yourself? Have you shared anything? Uh, yeah, I've shared a story in the Risk book. Um, it's called The Downward Spiral, and it's about uh, when my uncle passed away in 2014. Um, we hadn't seen him in 15 years, and we you know, heard out of the blue that he was dying, and we went down to visit him and um, uh, you know, found out that he had been living as a hermit and that his house was in total ruin, and it was just crazy. So. I uh, shared that story and a couple of other stories on the show, and it's it's always just a beautiful experience to put that stuff out there and see how people react and hear people say, you know, I was listening to your story as I drove a truck through England and I was just sobbing because I'd been through a similar thing, you know, so it's really cool to share on the show. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Do any of the other uh, interview reviewers have any questions that they want to ask or Eva about, about uh, the show or the books? I am just a little curious about your technical, <clears throat> about your technical um, aspects of it. I just saw, I saw an opera recently, and their problem was that two of the singers were in Philadelphia. One was in the Bronx. One was in, in you know, and the problem of getting the of getting the um, getting it all coordinated. It seems to me that that's something a software engineer could do if someone wanted to do that ultimately. But it is a problem trying to make something, you know. But you're. Did you deal? You don't have any problem with that, though. I assume you're not. You're not. Well, we're lucky. Beat. We're lucky that our artistic medium translates well to Zoom shows because you know you just have one person talking at a time for about ten right. to fifteen minutes, and you don't need any special effects. You don't need music. You know all that kind of stuff. So um, we've had an easier time with it than say stand-up comedians or musicians, um, sure. where the tech isn't quite as good for what they're trying to do. No, I, I really love the intimate feeling of it. It's nice to. I, mean, I don't know you, and I feel like I know you. I'm in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's, that's really true, because, because I heard four stories last night. And I, so now, having experienced that, I know the most intimate moments of four people, you know, that maybe even some of their friends or family knew. So it really, when you see their courage and the commitment with which they tell these stories, it makes you think, wow, what do I have? that I could share, that I would want to share, that would, um, it, it isn't that why writers and performers spend their lives sometimes in poverty, you know, and scraping by trying to find a way to connect to other people, to create something that's, that's forever, really. You and I you, think you, this sorry. is just one of the most beautiful shows yeah. I've seen. So I think if people, you know, could get the book and listen to the podcast, uh, they would immediately render the show because they'd want to be part of it live either via zoom or eventually back in person i i can't recommend it highly enough really well, thank you i think more people are, are, are able to talk um and to talk intimately because they're in their own space yeah I mean, you know that's i know you guys too. have to leave now it's, it's after one o'clock <clears throat> but i want to let people know this is an ongoing event and um the, the next show is may 16th mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get tickets for the next live stream at risk-show.com slash tour. Um, yeah, our website is risk-show.com, so there's plenty of information there. And then on all the social media, we're at Risk Show. Yeah, and you can listen to Risk wherever you get podcasts. Thank, Thank you. you so much. This was fascinating. Thank Wonderful. you so much. I, I,
appreciate it. Get to miss next time. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Very nice to have seen you. You too. See you later. And good luck in the future. Break a leg, I mean. Break a leg. Do we break legs anymore? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jen and I actually saw some plays, which we can <clears throat> talk about now. Um, mm -hmm. We let's see how much time we have left. We have nine minutes left, so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw something called "Felt Sad," posted a frog, and other streams of global quarantine from the Cherry Artist Collective from Ithaca, New York, my old college alma mater, uh -huh. and. They got international writers from all over the place to tell these stories from <laughs> Belgrade and Bucharest and Buenos Aires and Berlin and Ithaca and all sorts of different places. And but my favorite was Berlin. He was so funny. He had great comic timing. Godfrey L. Simmons. He had the most illustrious expressions and pithy remarks that made me laugh outright. And it's all about connecting or not connecting. Mm -hmm. And um you know, having a birthday party, how to do this all with, you know, with virtual, we're all being virtual right now. People are reading, you know, trying to read Casanova's memoirs. Well, and I did. <laughs> some I did. of the stories worked and some didn't. So I basically <laughs> gave this um, a happy face minus. And the whole review, I mean, we still have the Facebook page going. In fact, you should go to our Facebook page because I post all the all the free events going on, all the virtual events going on. There's so much going on, and so um, and there's a longer review there. And then, uh, so now I'll let Jan do one of his reviews, then I'll come back and do my other review. So Jan, do one of your reviews. Okay, I am putting both of the reviews. Of these I put three uh, online reviews on up on Facebook so far. Uh, the first one is called Monotony, which was a very interesting, uh, actually, it's, it's almost, uh, it's a musical. It's called the musical for home or work, for you to listen to while you're working at home and you're working at work. What it reminded me of was radio, and I know I'm going to hear once again, I'm going to give away my age because I grew up with radio, and radio was marvelous when I was a kid. Um, and this uh, Monotony piece was really charming. It was about, it took place in an office, it was fully, fully, uh, scripted fully casted it could be put on the stage i could easily see it put on the stage it was a about a boy who who's a millennial who has gotten himself into a job that he hates already and that he already realizes is going to drive him crazy if he has to do it the rest of his life and he falls in love with the son of the owner who wants to be a comic book writer so um so there they go through this business day after day after day monotony in their offices very very funny and the music is terrific, really terrific. The only thing I saw was they are they, as I said, the problem with radio has they've lost the art of doing it because occasionally the music was too loud for the the underscoring was too loud for the dialogue and uh, th and this kind of thing, um, and they would have silences instead of continuing to talk all the way through. But really, really fun and uh, very uh, very good. And I, I there's a review up on face uh, on Facebook about this with the, with the um the link to it if you'd like to go up and listen to it monotony it's called um and i've lost the piece that i i did a piece about it this morning and i sent it to mark and i don't <laughs> we're giving it a happy face oh happy face yes happy face okay okay oh, yeah, again if, um, i'm sure on there it is i'm sure you could find more on um our facebook page but this is if you could read it a little bit uh, um, what we have that Jan sent me about monotony. Anyway, right we've got we've got like five minutes left, so we, I want to speed things up. Yeah, go so through. So the other play I saw was called um, Kenneth Noel's I Don't See Mom from the Looking Glass Theater here in New York City. It's uh, a telling play about how little progeny know about their parents. Siblings try to set up a Zoom meeting with their mom, and they get a shock when confronted by an unknown woman. It's believably acted within virtual constraints. And the actors were Erica Becker, J. William Thomas, and um, and, and Molly Parker Myers. And it, it, they were a Southern family. And, you know, she doesn't care about being cooped up. She wants to go to the shooting range. And nobody's there anyway, so what's the problem? The brother is a priest, and he's beset with 21st century problems that 
make him have to change the normal Baptist sort of religious values. And the thing about their mom is just startling and how they, and it was only 30 minutes long. And I thought this would make a great web series because this was interesting characters, interesting families, and I wanted to know more about them. So again, I am giving this a full happy face. I, this one I really liked a lot. Great. We only have like a minute left. So I want to talk about Metropolitan Playhouse is doing a virtual playhouse and go to www.facebook.com slash hydramas because we're putting up everything there, all the information of what you can see and do. There's stars in the house. There's Andrew Lloyd Webber. There's um, all sorts of amazing events going Wonderful on. Wonderful Sondheim piece. We've got like five minutes left. So I want to speed things up. Yeah, go so for it. The other play I saw was called... Um, Kenneth Knowles, I Don't See Mom, from the Looking Glass Theater here in New York City. It's a, a telling play about how little progeny know about their parents. Siblings try to set up a Zoom meeting with their mom, and they get a shock when confronted by an unknown woman. It's believably acted within virtual constraints. And the actors were Erica Becker, J. William Thomas, and, um, and, and Molly Parker Myers. And it, it, they were a Southern family and, you know, she doesn't care about being cooped up. She wants to go to the shooting range and nobody's there anyway. So what's the problem? The brother is a priest and he's beset with 21st century problems that make him have to change the normal Baptist sort of religious values. And the thing about their mom is just startling and how they, and it was only 30 minutes long. And I thought this would make a great web series because this was interesting characters, interesting families, and I wanted to know more about them. So again, I am giving this a full happy face. I, this one I really liked a lot. Great. And yeah, now again, the credits are, you know, up here, if anybody could see them, I'm not sure, but there's more on Facebook. Oh, that's really clear. That was really clear, yeah. Right, now your turn, Jan. So my turn? Yeah, you have the opera, don't you? Yeah, I have, again, a Zoom opera from the Hare Art Center. It was really, really terrific. Uh, Hare does some of the best uh, technolo technological work in the city. And uh, they, you know, turned all of their technological prowess to, um, the, to the website business, or to, you know, to Zoom. Uh, last year, Kamala Sakara, uh, Sakaram, which is her name, she's a young woman composer. She's probably about 40, 45. And, and so for me, she's young. Um, you know, and she's terrific, absolutely brilliant. Uh, put together a piece called Looking at You, which was quite fascinating. It had screens everywhere. We had screens on the tables and screens on the walls and the actors singing while it was all going on and, and live things happening on the stage it was fascinating. Well, this take the other day was a 15 minute take on doing an opera in Zoom. And uh, as I mentioned earlier before, the biggest problem they had was trying to coordinate everybody because there's a delay. Uh, anyone that sent a, an email knows that it doesn't happen, uh, you know, when water did arrive immediately somewhere. It doesn't do that all the time. There's a slight delay. And so they had a problem, but it was fascinating watching uh, her talk about how they had solved these problems of all of these people singing. As I, I said earlier, two were in Philadelphia, one was in Manhattan, one was in Brooklyn. Um, and what, you know, so they were all over the place. So they were coming in at different times. So it had to be written very carefully. And um, Kamala showed a very, very interesting set of her, 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 um, you know, her notation. It, had, it, it was actually notated, but they had, rather than starting at a specific point, they would do a certain amount and then skip to the next one and then go to the next one. So it was, it's a different every time they do it. Anyway, fascinating stuff. I'm calling this a report rather than a review, and it was a, a very happy place, report rather than a review, because it's not up to snuff aesthetically yet, but technically it's fascinating. Is, so, anyway, we only have a minute yeah, and, and 30 seconds left. picture again over here if you want to see, is, and there's more on Is Facebook. it still going on? Is it still going on, this opera? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, is it still going Well, yes, it's still available, uh, and, and again, uh, I haven't put it up yet on uh, face on Facebook, but I'm going to do that this afternoon. And there's a clip on there for you seeing it if they want. I can mention the book, oh, sure. my book, uh, which we have these wonderful. I have copies now. Ewing Ewing reviewing 2018 and 2019, or the I the reviews from um, from uh, the last two years when we were actually going to stage, going to the theater. 
And so there's the books. They're wonderful books. And there's where to get the books, upsbooks.com. Is that mirror imaged up there? Yeah. They want okay. to. But we still have 44 seconds, 42. So yeah, let, let's, let's have it run its course. Okay. And we have 28 minutes and, you know, any last minute, you know, yep. anyone wants to say. Right. Uh, Matt well, Lawrence is doing interesting stuff of presenting little snippets from their archives. And I think Worcester Group has something going up now. So if you're interested in finding out about old classics from the avant-garde, you might find them online too. Oh yeah, Encores has, the, has opened up their archives. That's true, that's right. And Lincoln Center has stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Yeah, you know what, just go to any favorite theater of yours and click on their thing and see what they're doing. You yeah. never know. Okay, I'm done. It was great. I know you. You are just anxious to leave. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm. I'm got to figure out how to cut five minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hope this works. If not, we'll use mine. With my messy mind. My messy one. We'll work it out. Okay. okay. I'll be Bye, in touch then. later today. Bye this bye. was. I hope you all get this way, Eva. This is great. <laughs> well, if we could figure this out better, yeah. And we'll, and let's not have interview people until we know how to do this, because I feel bad. Well, I think that went well, because that was just interpersonal, and I think that was well. They should be happy. It was a really good interview. Oh, this is the first time we've used this software. Of course, we're going to have problems with it. Yeah. So yeah. It, we'll get better as we go. Well, again, Absolutely. to me, I, I'm sure that the screen change thing has, uh, screen share thing has changed. I'll send an email to, you know, the head of my department at OIU to find out if she has any suggestions. Yeah. Because, you know, I... If it stays this way, I'll never be able to use it again. How's how's the teaching going? Are you do you hate it or? Um, we have a two week break. Well, now it's only one more week, yeah. and I have no idea what classes I'll have, if any. Mm -hmm. Will you still have the same Zoom account, or will you have a different one for summer? I have no idea. Huh? Uh, I got to get going, guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. All right, bye, Jan. Good to see y'all. You care. too. Bye bye. I mean, I had no trouble getting in. Have these wonderful cabarets going on at 6 30 and they're brilliant mm -hmm. and i'm um, sorry for all the kinks and everything and our next show is going to be may 23rd and thank you to everyone that showed up and um let's hope this works